Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. This is the, I guess you would say, spring installment of the Rochester Medical Museum and Archives History a la carte program. And tonight we have Patricia Corcoran, who is president of the Mount, uh, excuse me, the Friends of Mount Hope, here to talk with us and tell us about Lillian Wald. A um, couple of housekeeping things. Um, please mute your mics um, so that we don't have any interference of people thinking out loud while Pat's talking. And if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. And after Pat's program is done, we'll do a Q&A period and I'll relay the questions on to her and we'll go from there. So thank you all again for coming and take it away, Pat. Welcome to all of you and happy Nurses Week to all of you as well. I am so happy to be with you tonight to talk about Lillian Wald, one of my favorite uh, people at Mount Hope Cemetery. Um, I've traveled a long, long time with Lillian Wald. Ever since I became a tour guide, I've been fascinated with her story. And um, <clears throat> I feel that every American should know about, the, about Lillian Wald, her place in history. And I think every child in Monroe County should know about Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass and Lillian Wald. And so I'm especially happy to share her story with you, her sisters and brothers in the healthcare field. You know, um, I will brag a little bit, Mount Hope Cemetery is on the National Register of Historic Places. And um, it's significant because it contains persons of transcendent importance, which is defined by the National Park Service as being of great eminence in their fields of endeavor or having had a great impact upon the history of their community, state, or nation. There are eight people that have this designation and among the people of great eminence is our own Lillian D. Walt. Lillian, nurse, social worker, child advocate, feminist, suffragist, trade unionist, pacifist, anti-militarist, immigrant rights advocate, founder of Visiting Nurse Service of New York, founder of Henry Street Settlement. How could a woman accomplish so much in 73 years of life? <clears throat> Ms. Wald is a woman of many titles. Her vision and work inspired many loving and powerful titles. Lady Light, Dear Lady of Miracles, She Who Must Be Obeyed, That Damn Nurse Troublemaker, Miss Liberty of the Lower East Side, Sister, Mother Henry. Her favorite title, however, Head Resident Henry Street Settlement. <clears throat> Lillian Wald was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, the third of four children. Her parents were immigrants. Her mother had come from Germany and her father from Poland. Both had come as children. Their ancestors were rabbis, professionals, merchants, and successful businessmen in Europe. In 1849, these families decided to leave their affluent life in Europe and come to America because they feared religious persecution. They settled in Cincinnati, the center of reform Judaism at that time. And um, Lillian's father, when he grew up, he started an optical business and he married Minnie Schwartz in the middle when she was only 16 years old. Max on the right-hand side was a quiet erudite man while Minnie was the energetic, beautiful center of the family. Minnie's father and brother were constantly at their home, and on the left is Minnie's uh, 
father. Lillian's life revolved around this family. Her grandfather was like her surrogate father. Her grandfather, lovingly called Favy, recited German legends, Bible stories, and Shakespeare. He bought the children ponies. He, bought a, he brought a German theatrical company to town so that the children could hear stories in German. And he built the children a playhouse modeled after a typical cottage in rural Germany. He also bought the children ponies. So as she said, she was a spoiled, indulged child. Um, Lillian was a very bright, energetic child who loved books and drama. Her mother was convinced she would be a writer. Her best friend was her brother, Alfred. He excelled in so many areas that his father and mother had high hopes for him. He wrote a newspaper when he was a child and together he and Lillian would put on theatrical productions. Lillian dreamed that Alfred would become a doctor and she would be his assistant. In 1878, the family moved to Rochester where they had many relatives. All of the Rochester family was in the clothing industry. Her uncles, uh, Henry and Morris Schwartz, had one of Rochester's earliest and most successful clothing uh, firms. And her aunt's husband led another clothing business called Michael Levi and Company. Lillian's family moved into a lovely home on East Avenue and relocated later to another beautiful home on South Union Street next to her uncle Henry's. Lillian was raised in a liberal religious atmosphere and attended Miss Crittenden's school, having been referred there by Dr. Max Landsberg, head of the Reformed Jewish Temple. Miss Crittenden's English and French School for Young Ladies and Little Girls produced disciplined young women prepared for college. In the 1880s, parents were not really interested in girls attending college. People thought of this school as good preparation for finding a husband. Lillian was stunningly beautiful, popular with lots of male suitors. She applied to go to Vassar at the age of 16 and she was rejected as being too young. So she continued studying at Miss Crittenden's. In 1885, tragedy struck the Wald family. At the age of 25, Lillian's brother, Alfred, who was in California, drowned. Lillian's mother became bedridden in her grief and for two years Lillian ministered to her mother and got a job in a business just to take her mind off this terrible tragedy. Now you're wondering why I don't have a lot of pictures and that's because unfortunately a fire in the Wald's Rochester home destroyed all the tangible relics of Lillian's early life, her books, her records, and their family albums. <clears throat> in May 1888, Lillian's sister Julia married Charles Berry, son of the wealthy Irish Berry family of Elwanger Berry fame. They built a beautiful Georgian home on East Avenue. Many dreamed that Lillian would follow in her sister's footsteps and find a worthy suitor. Now, during this time, Lillian had no contact with the poor. She was oblivious to the drama of poverty unfolding in the other side of Rochester. For example, when she was 18 years old, 16 year old Emma Goldman was working at Garson's clothing factory in Rochester, 10 and a half hours a day, six days a week for $2.50. She called Rochester the flower city for the rich. Lillian was also oblivious to the crusades of Susan B. Anthony who lived nearby. At the age of 22, Lillian moved in with her sister, Julia. Julia was pregnant and in poor health. The family hired a nurse and Lillian became captiv captivated with this nurse and her work. She decided to pursue a career in nursing and applied to the New York School of Nursing in New York City. On her application, she wrote, 
I have many social ties in Rochester, which might interfere with earnest, uninterrupted work there. I have had the advantages of, white, of what might be called a good education, knowing Latin and able to speak both French and German. My life hitherto has been a type of modern American young womanhood, days devoted to society, study, and housekeeping duties such as practical mothers consider essential of a daughter's education. But that does not satisfy me now. I feel the need of serious, definite work. I have chosen nursing because I feel I have a natural aptitude for it. And because it has been for it has been for years, it appeared to me womanly, congenial work, work that I love and which I think I could do well. So Lillian graduated in March 1891 from nursing school in New York, and in May her father died. She returned to Rochester to care for her mother, sell their home, and move her mother into her sister's home. In August, she returned to New York City for her first job as a nurse in the juvenile asylum. That was a very traumatic experience for Lillian, and she only lasted one year. She applied to the Women's Medical College, a medical school started by Elizabeth Blackwell, and she set off to become a doctor. She had given up on nursing. During this course of study, she volunteered to teach home care in a Sabbath school to teach hygiene to immigrant women on Henry Street. This course was sponsored by Betty Loeb, a well-known philanthropist in New York. It was during this internship that she experienced what she calls a baptism of fire. And I will read um, this part to you. And this is from one of her two books, The House on Henry Street. A sick woman in a squalid rear tenement, so wretched and so pitiful that in all the years since, I have not seen anything more appealing, determined me within half an hour to live on the east side. From the schoolroom where I had been giving a lesson in bed making, a little girl led me one drizzling March morning. She had told me of her sick mother and gathering from her incoherent account that a child had been born, I caught up the paraphernalia of the bed making lesson and carried it with me. The child led me over broken roadways, over dirty mattresses and heaps of refuse, between tall reeking houses. The child led me on through a tenement hallway across a court into a rear tenement by slimy steps whose accumulated dirt was augmented that day by the mud of the streets and finally into the sick room. All the maladjustments of our social and economic relations seemed epitomized in this brief journey and what was found at the end of it. The family to which the child led me was neither criminal nor vicious. Although the family of seven shared their two rooms with boarders who were literally boarders since a piece of timber was placed over the floor for them to sleep on. And although the sick woman lay in a wretched unclean bed, soiled with a hemorrhage two days old, they were not degraded human beings judged by any measure of moral values. In fact, it was very plain that they were sensitive to their condition and when at the end of my ministrations they kissed my hands, it would have been some solace if by any conviction of the moral unworthiness of the family I could have defended myself as part of a society which permitted such ex conditions to exist. Indeed, my subsequent acquaintance with them revealed the fact that miserable as their state was, they were not without ideals for the family life and for society of which they were so unloved and unlovely a part. That morning's experience was a baptism of fire. Deserted 
were the laboratory and the academic work of the college. I never returned to them. On my way from the sick room to my comfortable student quarters, my mind was intent on my own responsibility. To my inexperience, it seemed certain that conditions such as these were allowed because people did not know. And for me, there was a challenge to know and to tell. When early morning found me still awake, my naive conviction remained that if people knew things and things meant everything implied in the condition of this family, such horrors would cease to exist. And I re rejoiced that I had had a training in the care of the sick that in itself would give me an organic relationship to the neighborhood in which this awakening had come. So when Lillian met this family, she not only ministered to the mother and to the newborn baby, but she sent one of the children to the store to buy food. The father was a cripple. And she scrubbed the floors of that house and cleaned the entire place. This is one of her favorite, favorite sayings. If you were on my tour, I'd give you a bookmark with some of her favorite sayings. Nursing is love in action and there is no finer manifestation of it than the care of the poor and the disabled in their own homes. Having given up becoming a doctor, she and her nursing friend, uh, Mary Brewster, decided they were going to go down to Henry Street and set up shop. First, they lived with a group of women who were doing outreach kinds of things, and they got their own apartment. And this is their apartment here. Um, they were able to finance this because Lillian was able to go to philanthropists and get money. That was one of her talents. Um, she visited Betty Loeb, a famous uh, Jewish philanthropist, and uh, Betty Loeb agreed to give these two women $120 a month for living expenses and nursing supplies. And Mrs. Loeb says, I've had a wonderful experience. I talked to a young woman who was either crazy or a genius. And uh, that's when she became interested in the work of Lillian Wald. And Lillian says, we were both quite ignorant, but we did know that we cared for these neighbors. They were living in a kind of tenement and they made friends with the people on every floor. And that was their initial um, work at Henry Street. But because Betty Loeb was connected to other philanthropists, um, this house was given to her by uh, one of the relatives of Betty. And this was quite a gift, don't you think? This was where she and uh, Mary would start their outreach. And this is the original Henry Street settlement. And it's still today, the Henry Street settlement. These are drawings of what it looked like with all the children outside. And um, she had certain rules. One was that the word poor was never used at Henry Street. She says, to us, it is a weasel word conveying a sense of failure, most humiliating to the people who suffer from poverty. So uh, what Lillian was able to do was attract many young women, mostly from affluent families who were trained nurses and wanted some kind of adventure in their life. So they went to New York and they lived in the Henry Street settlement. And every morning they would sit around the breakfast table and they would be given their assignments for the day as to what families that they would be visiting. They would charge after much ado, Lillian came to the conclusion that they had to charge something because people were offended if things were, were free. And also there had been other nurses in that neighborhood 
who had been involved with um, trying to convert people to different religions. So the people were suspicious of um, nurses coming to the house. But um, Lillian was able to get the New York Health Department to give her a badge and insi insignia that said City of New York. And that made her able to get to be welcome to these houses. Plus, she charged 10 cents per visit. Now, these are the principles that Lillian established for the Henry Street Settlement. The Henry Street Settlement was to be independent and non-sectarian. That's very important that it wasn't affiliated with any religion. A basic tenet in a democracy was that a poor patient had as much right as a wealthy one to call a nurse. And this right existed regardless of racial, religious, or ethnic origin. Two, it would be headed and administered by nurses themselves. Three, the nurses would live in the districts in which they worked. And her nurses lived in the settlement house. Sounds pretty exciting. <clears throat> I always think it must've been like a Peace Corps adventure. Ruth Cohen describes her first encounter with Miss Wald in her book called Out of the Shadows. I opened my eyes and saw a woman, a stranger sitting beside the couch. Neither in looks nor in dress had I ever seen one like this. She was beautiful and distinguished. How do you feel, she asked me. Her Lips smiled, but her eyes were sad. She spoke to my mother in German, gave her a card and went away. I spelled out the printed name on the card, Lillian D. Walt, 265 Henry Street. In 1893, Lillian coined the word, the phrase public health nursing. Previous to this time, student nurses worked in hospitals and more experienced nurses did private care nursing such as Julia's family hired a private nurse when she was having health problems. But public health nursing was a brand new profession. And here you can see that Lillian is starting to um, fundraise for public health nursing and also to get people to become interested in becoming public health nurses. And you'll hear me say fundraising because every nurse that Lillian hired, she had to raise the money for that person. There was no government assistance at all. So she was very dependent on philanthropists. Here's one of her posters telling people how, what a great profession it is to become a public health nurse. <clears throat> then within the Henry Street Settlement, she starts the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. So this was one of her pioneering ventures. And up until recently, every visiting nurse office was supposed to have a picture of Lillian Wald, but Lately, I've noticed there's some diff they don't use visiting nurse service anymore. They have some other acronym for this here in Rochester. Here she's trying to raise money again for the sick and distressed in their homes during the winter. Now the Henry Street settlement was part of this settlement house concept that started in England, then came to the United States. And in this picture here, you'll see them having a, a meeting in uh, White Plains. And Lillian is sitting down with a white blouse and behind her is Jane Adams. And um, this movement was popular during this time. Um, 
all in all settlement houses, people resided in the same buildings in which neighborhood residents participated in programs and activities. Living in close proximity, the staff regarded the people who used the settlement as neighbors, not clients. We had some settlement houses here in Rochester, but I don't think that people actually lived in them, such as Lewis Street Settlement, Baden Street Settlement, Charles House. Um, they may have started later, but uh, I've never heard that the people actually lived there. By the way, not only did nurses live there, but other people would, that were coming through town that were progressives would live there too. Everyone was welcome. And so every morning they would have these big discussions on what was going on in the world. This was her first group of nurses that came to work with her. Some of them became quite famous. I'm sure that many of you have heard of Lavinia Doc. Uh, she was called a nurse extraordinaire and she wrote the early nursing textbooks. Uh, she was a Russian translator a professional pianist, a suffragist, and uh, we could do a whole program on Lavinia Doc. She's the woman sitting um, next to Lillian with the dark hair. Next on the other side of Lillian is um, Isabella Waters who became the first professor at Columbia Teachers College, the first nursing program that they started there. And she was one of the professors. So these are some of the people that worked with her. Now Jane Adams would come to um, New York often and stay with uh, Lillian and Lillian would also go to the Hull House. So they were very close friends. Lavinia, I told you about, she was um, very active in the suffrage movement. We'll talk about her later. And uh, Florence Kelly, was a lawyer and social activist. She graduated from Cornell. She went to Europe and uh, she was a friend of uh, socialists like Frederick Engels. She translated all of his works in the US and all of the works of Karl Marx. So you can see she was a brilliant woman. She married a Russian uh, man, got divorced, had three children and the children would hang out at Henry Street must have been very interesting because she was on the road a lot. Um, she devoted her life to dealing with children's rights. She wrote a book called Our Tolling Children and um, she was involved with investigating child labor. She was an incredibly talented lawyer and um, it's the kind of people that hung out at Henry Street Settlement. Now within the settlement, there were many activities and one was teaching because these children were all immigrant children. And so they would have classes in English and other things too. So in the children could come there and study. Lillian believed that the arts were an essential part of education and the Henry Street Settlement provided informal workshops, studios, festivals and plays, music lessons and concerts. She encouraged ethnic celebrations where people could share their cultures through music, dance, and drama. And this theater was a donation from another group of philanthropists, two sisters that volunteered in the Henry Street Settlement. And they were the ones that paid for this uh, playhouse, which became famous all over New York City. People would come and see plays in different languages. Uh, Another thing that maybe you've never thought about is our fresh air program that we still have today. This was started by Lillian Wald in New York City. She always believed that play was important and she felt that children needed an experience in the country. And she had many contacts in uh, the Catskills and in Connecticut, many family, wealthy families who in the summer would open their homes to children from the Henry Street Settlement and their mothers. So the mothers would have a vacation too. 
Uh, and she was had to raise money for this again. And here she is with her different um, flyers about the fresh air program. Charles Gutman was an eight year old boy when he lived on Henry Street. In adulthood, he contributed $500,000 to the Henry Street settlement and explained the reasons for his gift. The Henry Street settlement took me and a lot of Irish and Italian kids and sent us off to the country. You can't explain what a thrill it was. I'll never forget it and there's no way I can really pay them back. I never knew what a cow was. Sure, I knew what grass was. We had plenty of that in those days, but a cow, no, sir. This contribution doesn't even the score, but at least it serves to mark an experience that helped open a poor boy's eyes to the possibilities of life in America. <clears throat> now, playgrounds. Can you imagine that when Lillian was given this building, she noticed that on one side of it was an empty area. So she had an idea that she could turn that into a play area. And the neighbors also gave her some of their land so she could start a playground. Now this was unheard of in those days. So you can see uh, the two pictures on the right are her playground. The one on the left is the roof of this place. But um, she started this because she was so upset by seeing children play in the streets all the time. And so she felt that playgrounds were essential for children and not just children, but for the whole community. So um, she took this piece of land and she made it beautiful. They planted trees, they had, they put some swings and kinds of things like that. They put places where you could put a hammock down so you could bring your baby and put the baby in the hammock. They made this a very special spot. And it was so popular that they had to make schedules like certain hours, mothers and babies could come, certain hours, teenagers could come, then children could come and then uh, elderly people could come. That's how busy it was. And um, she made a deal with kids that if you wanted to come during children's time and you brought a baby with you, you got to the front of the line. So of course, just about every family she said had a baby. So uh, that was easy. But if by chance you didn't have a baby in your house, she said you would, the children would go to neighbors' houses and try to borrow a baby so they could get into the playground. So I'm um, having, she realized that this was so successful. So down the street from Henry Street, there was an empty space. And that's where she started the Outdoor Recreation League in New York City. The first public playground was called Seward Park. And after that, she was very influential in building playgrounds all over New York City. That's amazing, isn't it? Today we think playgrounds are nothing, but in those days they were so important. Money was always a challenge. Um, her main benefactor was Jacob Shift. He and his wife were very close to Lillian and they helped her a great deal. In 1909, um, Mr. Shift wrote in her guest book I have been as proud, never been as happy concerning anything in my life than the cooperation. It, it has been my good fortune and privilege to render the self-sacrificing constructive work done in the Henry Street Settlement under the intelligent and efficient guidance of Miss Lillian Wald. God bless her. Now, he also was like a father figure to, um, her and her business advisor, and he helped her raise money and bring in other philanthropists. People said if you went out to dinner with Lillian Wald, it would cost $5,000 to sit next to her because she could shake anyone down for money. Um, that's amazing. She also uh, had to learn a lot of religious knowledge from uh, Jacob Schiff when she would be 
giving talks to our Jewish groups. He would remind her, for example, when the Jewish holidays were. And uh, once she was preparing a speech on women's suffrage and she asked uh, Mr. Shift for quotes from the Talmud or quotes from your lore. I love that lore. I'm sure he was like, no, because she had a lack of Jewish education. So she wanted to be prepared for her um, talks, which usually ended up in raising a lot of money. Um, sometimes they disagreed, but not often. It, in 1914, she erected a Christmas tree and uh, he noticed it and he told her that she had to take it down. It was in her kindergarten room and uh, she was very upset by this. But then he talked to her and said that um, even though they were many Italian and Irish children that he felt that some children would feel badly because they don't celebrate Christmas. It didn't matter what she felt. She said, I'm going to take it down. And she learned her lesson. Many times she had to not get involved in controversy because she was dependent on benefactors. And that became especially apparent with her with suffrage activities. Um, now, she did something very amazing. She looked at public schools as a way to really help children with problems that are not involved with learning. And she says the state recognizes its responsibility for the development of citizens. To meet this responsibility, the school is its most efficient agency. So now she's gonna bring her nursing talents into the public school system. The first thing she did was notice that many children were out of school because they uh, had learning disabilities or physical handicaps. So she convinced the Board of Education to start as an experiment, a special, special education class that was led by one of the women that lived in the Henry Street settlement, Elizabeth Farrell. And the city was always trying to get children off of the streets. So they were attracted to this idea. And this was the first special education uh, school in New York City. And then this expanded to other schools as well. And this Elizabeth Farrell became very famous and wrote books about her experience. A huge problem in New York City were children that were expelled from school because they had some kind of problem like lice or any some kind of skin rashes or diseases. So they were out on the street sometimes for years and years. Remember the classes in that time were very large, like maybe 70 children. So um, if your child got kicked out of school, chances are they would stay kicked out because they would just wander around the streets. And um, so Lillian said, we as nurses can do something about this. First, the uh, Board of Education hired doctors, but they would come like once a week for an hour and then they couldn't follow through. So uh, that wasn't a very successful program. But Lillian came forward to the Board of Education and said, let's do an experiment. Let's take a school nurse and put her in a school and see if we can do something about keeping children in school and bringing other children in school. So she hired Alina Rogers, who was a Henry Street nurse. She was hired as the city's first public school nurse. Now, this is so amazing. In her first month, Rogers treated 893 students, made 137 home visits, and helped 25 children who had received no previous medical attention recover and return to school. Shortly thereafter, the Board of Health hired its first fleet of 12 school nurses. What an incredible contribution this was. She felt that all the children in school should receive a free lunch. She doesn't think that children should be segregated into saying that you people have to pay for your lunch and you people get a free lunch. And she said, it's a serious loss to the individual child to have a free food kitchen associated with the school. His most precious gift if foreign born is the absence of class distinction in the public school. 
the stronghold of democracy. And now in Rochester, we have free lunches for every child too. It's taken us a long time, but we've come to that. Um, in 1899, she persuaded Columbia to appoint the first professor of nursing in the country and started a series of lectures for prospective nurses at Teachers College. And this became the basis of the university's Department of Nursing and Health and caused nursing education to shift away from solely hospital taught training to university courses augmented by hospital field work. And at the same time, we know that Susan B. Anthony here in Rochester was realizing that the day is coming when trained nurses will be required to possess a college education. <clears throat> Lillian was very interested in labor unions. And here it is, her uncles are in Rochester running these um, clothing shops that uh, all went on strike eventually and they went out of business uh, and they went bankrupt. But uh, in New York City, they were having all kinds of problems with unions and um, people working at very low wages and very dangerous uh, situations. But this quote that she says here is very reminiscent of what's happening today in our world about uh, the place of women in the job market. She says over 5 million women are at work in the United States according to the 1900 census. Despite such figures as a nation, we superstitiously hug the belief that our women are at home and our children at school. As a whole, the community is reluctant to face the situation frankly and seriously. The women no longer spin and weave and card, no longer make the butter, and the cheese scarcely sew and put the preserves at home, but accomplish these same industries in the factories in open competition with men and except in the relatively few instances of trade organization in competition with each other. She was very involved in trying to settle um, strikes. And she said, if there's a strike, try to discover both sides of the question, not rejoicing in the workman's failure without understanding what was behind the discontent. 1911, this terrible tragedy, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. These were her neighbors, these girls that and women that died in this terrible fire. She had been fighting so hard for these factories to be made safe. And of course, this terrible tragedy was what really brought this to the attention of the government. 146 girls and women were killed in the Strangle Shirtwaist fire. She was called to testify after the fire in this New York State hearing. Miss Wald was going to speak. Everyone came and listened. Miss Wald didn't know anything about fire prevention, but she was known as a person whose heart was always in the right place and was greatly respected because she was loved. So when she went in to speak, there was a hush over the crowd. In the Henry Street settlement one day, all the people were sitting around breakfast table reading the paper. And uh, Florence Kelly mentioned, if the government can have a department to take such an interest in the nation's cotton crop, why can't it have a bureau to look after the nation's crop of children? Because the front page article was about bow weevils and the government was going to start a program. <clears throat> This was very important because children were sent out to work as early as they could because the parents needed the money. So they would just drop out of school and work under very horrendous circumstances. Here they are children getting their working papers at an early age. Um, 
Miss Wald was also interested in such a bureau to um, protect children from disasters. Like if there was a home fire, what would happen to the children? What would happen if the parents died? What, <clears throat> um, how could children be kept out of factories and in school? We had these same problems here in Rochester um, during the ages when if some parent died, the children would be put in orphanages. Here she is protesting child labor and unsafe conditions. This is one of the few pictures you'll see of her actually um, protesting because she wasn't usually uh, able to protest. She was afraid she'd lose her the money from her benefactors. They, they were against uh, suffrage kind of parades, but uh, there's, little, there's um, <clears throat> some of her people marching to get votes for women and Lavinia Dock is right there. Um, Lavinia Dock was 60 years old when she changed herself to the White House gate and was arrested and um, she was put into prison and uh, she was treated very badly, force fed and that kind of thing. And uh, so she was quite a hero. The first time she was arrested in New York City, the police chief saw her in the paddy wagon and he pulled her out and he remembered how she had helped his children. And she said, and he said, Miss Doc, I could never arrest you. And so she was freed by the chief of police. Um, however, Lillian worked in many ways for suffrage, even though she wasn't usually marching down the street. She organized the precincts of the area around Henry Street. And um, so that in 1915, there was an amendment that uh, failed to give women the right to vote. But two years later, thanks to uh, Miss Wald, the whole, whole area was organized and um, it passed. And so when her nurses would go to families' homes, they'd always talk to the men and try to encourage them to vote and explain why it would be so helpful for their families if the women could vote. She had a lot of influence with um, the immigrants and the neighbors, especially uh, Jewish male and female immigrants who were anxious to exercise the political rights that they had been denied in Europe. We know a lot about the Spanish influenza epidemic here in New York, thanks to the work of Terry Lair. But it's very interesting what happened in New York City in 1918. When the flu was beginning to attack New York City, the Red Cross summoned relief organizations and finally requested that Lillian Wall chair the Nurses Emergency Council. She agreed on the condition that all nursing agencies coordinate and work through Henry Street Centers. They agreed and the next morning, the Red Cross building became the headquarters and all the municipal and private agencies affiliated with social service groups, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, all agreed to Miss Wald's plan. Immediately volunteers were solicited and hundreds came to the office to offer their services at Bellevue Hospital and domestic science teachers came from Teachers College. So it was that the police, social agencies, tenement house inspectors, nurses, aides, and untrained volunteers were knit together in one group, all under the leadership of Lillian Walt. This woman was an organizer. By the way, she received a great deal of credit later in life for her work in the Spanish uh, influenza epidemic in New York. Now, can you believe that she was one of the original members of the NAACP and their first meeting was held in the Henry Street Settlement? And that's because she was very interested in civil rights and she insisted that all her classes be racially 
integrated. She was very interested in the treatment of African Americans. And the reason why the people in the NAACP came to Henry Street is they uh, were afraid that if they had white people and black people together, that they wouldn't want to sit together. And so uh, Lillian so cleverly said, we'll come to the Henry Street settlement and we will have um, a different kind of a dinner. We will have a dinner where everyone goes and picks up their food and walks around and no one sits down. So no one has to worry about who they're gonna sit next to. And uh, this very uh, simple solution made everyone say, okay, that's good, we'll go there. And so they did, and that's where the organization was started, the first meeting. Hmm. Okay, she was a very, very active in, uh, she was a pacifist and she was very active in um, expressing her ideas to the House of Representatives. Um, you'll be very interested in her advocacy for immigrants one day she was standing in front of the Henry Street settlement as school was getting out. And when she saw these children come down the street, she writes this, out they pour the little hyphenated Americans, more conscious of their patriotism than perhaps any other large group of children, unaware that to some of us, they carry on their shoulders our hopes of a finer, more democratic America when their old world tradition shall be mingled with the best that lies in our new world ideals. They bring a hope that a better relationship, even the great brotherhood is not impossible. And that through living love and understanding, we shall come to know the shame of prejudice. Here she's talking about good metal in our melting pot. Her great interest and faith in immigrants. I wish she could talk to our president today about bringing in more immigrants and refugees. Uh, okay. I'm always wishing that Lillian Weld were here in today's world. Um, at one point, Lillian's mother, uh, moved into the Henry Street settlement and she became very popular with the neighbors, especially the children. She taught embroidery and told them stories. She was beloved. And then because it was so hot in New York in the summer, Lillian decided to take her mother to Westport, Connecticut. And one year she rented a house and she loved Connecticut so much that she bought this house the second year called the house on the pond. And, uh, this is where she spent her later years. And she was very popular with the people in Westport. She actually had lights put in so the children could ice skate on her pond. Many visitors came from all over the world because she was world famous at this time. Jacob Reese, the famous social worker, um, met her mother and he said, it had never occurred to me that you had a mother I thought you were just you and always had been, but your mother is a person too. So uh, Minnie uh, lived here with um, Lillian and this is where she retired and became a very integral part of um, this town. And it would have been wonderful to be there and to see all the people that came to visit like Eleanor Roosevelt, like Helen Keller, people from all over the world came uh, as she retired from the Henry Street settlement. When she was 73 in 1940, uh, she died and um, thousands filled Carnegie Hall to celebrate Wald's remarkable legacy and to hear messages from leaders, including President Roosevelt, <clears throat> commending Lillian's vision, compassion and leadership. Unlike Susan B. Anthony, she was feted during her whole life. She was given all kinds of awards. Uh, here she's buried at Mount Hope Cemetery in the Brith Kodish area with her family. 
uh, on her headstone is this Far East inspired insignia that she designed for the Henry Street Settlement. And it's on the front of the Henry Street Settlement today. And what it means is we are all one family. This was her mantra. This is what her, by the way, this week, her whole, all of these stones will be clean. So they'll all be white. Um, here she's buried with her sister next to her and behind are her parents and her brother. People come from all over the world to visit her grave. And just yesterday, the nurses came and had a presentation there. Every nurses, every year they come and pay homage to Lillian Walt. She received honors from many different places, even during her life. Here's, uh, she was considered one of the 12 greatest living American women in 1922. She, outstanding citizen of New York. <clears throat> She's in the Hall of Fame at Seneca Falls, the Women's Hall of Fame. She's also in the American Nurses Association Hall of Fame. She's one of the first 15 women that were inducted into that, that uh, place. And um, here she is at NYU. This is quite a beautiful um, presentation they have of her as a humanitarian. And then in 2007, she uh, was an honoree in the Jewish American Hall of Fame. She wouldn't have been too thrilled with this because she was a little stubborn. Uh, when people called her like a Jewish social worker or a Jewish nurse, she said, I will not be pigeonholed. She scorned religious categories. She told the reporter for the New York World Telegram in December, 1930, I love this. People are fed or hungry, warm or cold, well or sick, happy or unhappy. These are the only classifications I know. Um, <clears throat> these enduring lessons are also part of the current Henry Street settlement then and now. This is in the uh, literature we get from the Henry Street settlement. Each of us is whole and worthy. Poverty is a social issue. There is power in bridging differences. Neighbors matter. In times of need, act. People rise and fall together. No one group or nation dare be an economic or social law, law unto itself. This is the newest book on Henry on uh, Lillian Wald and the Henry Street Settlement. The first part of it is all about Lillian Wald. It just came out a year ago. And it gives us a great insight into what's going on at Henry Street today. And a lot is going on. They're really worthy of our support. And this is my final slide. Never in all the years have we on Henry Street doubted the validity of our belief in the essential dignity of man and the obligation of each generation to do better for the oncoming generation. Lillian D. Wall. RN, Visiting Nurse Service of New York, founder. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. And I'll see if I can see people. I can see Kathleen. Oh, so that was so neat. I, I knew 